Here's my presentation on Stealth Paradigm Shift through online education. This presentation is going to be a little bit different because I adjusted it for this specific occasion, which is virtual presentation. So literally everything that I'm going to say is what you're going to see on the screen. So I will talk about two impeding paradigm shifts in higher education. The first paradigm shift, as I see it, is in the past, there was a shortage of information and one would go to the university to get the information that has not been readily available. One had to learn the provided information in a disciplined way, which was essentially centered around repetition. One had to be able to demonstrate the retention of that memorized information and one had to be able to apply the information and do something with it. For all these qualities, one received a university diploma with a specific degree. So, diploma showed that one was disciplined to go through the educational system and succeed in completing courses that were provided within a specific curriculum. Many students did not like to study the majority of those courses. They studied subjects which they don't like and received information they don't get to ever use in their lives. Huge amount of college received information students largely considered inapplicable, useless. Let me tell you one uh, anecdote. In 2018, I was at the OAB conference in Berlin, and there was a session with German high school students that were extremely eloquent and smart and had very high grades in high school. And they were talking about their education. So I asked them a question if they remember any of the subjects that they received high grades last semester. And they all agreed that they don't remember anything or virtually anything, that they forgot all the information as soon as they get their grades. Then I asked them, but don't you see that this is a problem? that you're not retaining any information learned in college? And their reply was that the only thing they're interested in is to how to beat the system and how to go through the system, not really to learn and educate themselves. So I was really surprised and disappointed by their response, but that was what they told us, and it was quite disappointing. So university's point of view is that they will create educated people who are able to engage in all kinds of different professions and vocations. And this is what students' point of view is. So now we live in an age of information luxury or overload. Thus, the universities are not the only source of information anymore. Therefore, the role of teachers has to change. The teachers should not be providers of information as in the past, but rather must become facilitators of learning. A shift from memorizing and reproduction to learning how to learn becomes essential. There is an understandable impetus for existing educational paradigm change. And at the same time, as expected, there is enormous resistance to that change. Why? Because if the academic curricula gets substantially changed, in that process, many teachers and their skills might become obsolete or, to say it bluntly, not needed. Now let me talk about paradigm shift number two that I also see. The 19th century vision of education is that something happens at the single institution, single place, classroom, and at a particular time. The shift that needs to happen is to move from education to learning. And learning happens anywhere and anytime. Students are already doing that on their own, as the interaction between a teacher and a student and curriculum is rapidly being redefined. The role and the form of higher education have hardly changed, aside from PowerPoint presentations replacing most writing on the blackboard style ones. In digital age, the learning environment is completely blown open. And universities have been notorious for being slow in adopting changes. But the society and the profile of students who are enrolling in the universities is changing at the speed that is becoming increasingly difficult to adjust to. Accommodating these new generation of ever-changing students is going to be a monumental task for the higher educational institution. Embarking onto completely new roles and missions driven by global social, technological, and economical changes is going to be a rather painful process. So, here is my reaction to these two paradigm shifts that I presented here. My assumption is that the institutional change which universities must undertake 
will be vastly inadequate and immensely late in the response to what is generally happening in the society. However, some of rather imaginative instructors might circumvent that situation by taking individual actions, which, in a stealth way, could take a leap ahead, anticipating the impeding paradigm shifts in higher education. I see that within the existing rigid academic structures, online education through the use of mobile devices might facilitate these paradigm changes in a stealth way. We see the ever-present use of mobile devices everywhere, from kids to students. So, I'm going to talk about iPhone and music iPhone is small, but it's probably got more power under the hood than your last computer, as we all know. And now every computer, smartphone or tablet come today with many pre-installed music making tools or apps that can be downloaded for free or a minimal fee. Now, GarageBand is probably the most known one. Just as anyone can use word processing software, anyone can use pretty much with the same ease the e-music creation software. With ever-expanding computer technology, electronic ways of making music have been completely democratized. Improvisation is at the heart of this new musical paradigm that uniquely reflects contemporary life. Vast library of synths, drum machines, and one-of-a-kind apps allow people to produce music music easier than at any point in history. iPhone apps can enable complete beginners and as well as experienced musicians to create interesting music tracks. However, iPhone is not ever going to replace the desktop computer for making music. Its portability means that it can be used whenever creativity strikes. It's a musical sketchpad one can use to quickly record ideas or as a tool for generating new ideas. This situation enabled for the music skills to become democratized. Okay, so you get the point. So I decided to create making e-music class that I introduced in the summer of 2016. It is a non-synchronous 100% online class anytime, anyplace. It's also a self-regulating learning class that students are hoped to be metacognitively and motivationally and behaviorally active participants in their own learning processes. So the class is adjusted to everybody's level of competence. I had to do some serious content chunking so that students can embark on it in sequential and small digestible pieces. I also substituted my lectures to already available online videos. So pretty much everything already exists online. So the class teaches students the most general concept of musical creativity by using technology that they are already familiar with. So the class comes under the university core as creative experience class. And you can read all this fine print, but basically the class teaches basic creativity. So it's one of those classes that any student at university can take. Kind of classes like beginning acting or drawing or beginning dance. Beginning creativity, if you wish. So you can go and read all this fine print and learn what the university core creative experience in detail is. So here it is, you can go and read all that. But it's basic, basic creativity. So the class was optimized for 12 students. It's a six week, 100% asynchronous online class offered only in summer session. Every week, students embark on a different learning module and they make music on iPhones by using simple music making apps. Most of those are free or minimum fee. So 90% of instructional material already exists online like YouTube and other sources. And I have carefully selected which of that material students have to digest. I acted as a person who points the students in certain direction. So I was their sophisticated Google search engine. So this is the semester schedule 
for three weeks. So the first week they learn the basic creativity, uh, counting beats, song structure, and then they embark on these different music making apps such as Remix, Love, Launchpad, Oxy, GarageBand, NoteBeat, and so forth. And every week they create music with different app. So these are the apps that are available. Okay, so what do they do? First, they create a project draft and send it to the instructor. So, so these are deliverables. They have to create a structural outline, which is they have to explain what are they planning to do and what their performance or musical piece is going to look like in terms of structure. And here are some examples of structural outline that they would send to me. It would be intro and chorus and verse and so forth. So they have to have a plan. And then I would listen to that draft and send them my feedback. So the feedback may look like this. I would give them my comments on how to continue, what to change, how to improve and so forth. They would read that and tweak their project and submit the final version of the project. Then I would post all the projects online, anonymously, of course, and then students would have to listen to all of those and provide their own critique and analysis of what they find that worked for them in those projects and what didn't work. For example, this is the description of what they have to do. They have to pick three best projects and write about them and say why they like them and why are those projects good. And also they would have to pick one that didn't work for them and explain why. So it would look like this. It would be all number based. Nobody would know who is who. So it would be all anonymous. And they would just listen to these audios and write about them. So here's an example of what students actually said about some of the projects. Again, you can go back and read this fine print if you want. It basically forces students to be analytical and also it gives them an idea of their own standing so they can measure themselves against other students and see what others are doing and learn from that analysis and comparison. Then I would post their rankings online so they would know who ranked first, third and second and which project needs improvement. So every week they would rank the projects and then I would post those rankings. Here are some examples of what students did, so I'm just going to play a little bit. And so forth. So here's another app.
so these are students that have absolutely no previous music knowledge. And some of them may have some knowledge, but it's not a requirement. The assumption is that anybody can do this. They would like to be doing this. So later on in the class, they have to do the final analysis assessment. They have to write a little assignment and explain which app they liked the best and why, and, and which one they didn't like and why, and so forth. And actually, it develops their analytical skills. And then they have to create the final music assignment with one of the apps that they like the best. And that is all that they have to do for the class. The idea was that, first of all, they do something that they like and something that they enjoy, something that they use technology that they are really familiar with. Therefore, hopefully, they would remember some of that stuff. And also that this is all done online and with mobile devices, so they can do it literally anytime, any place, and do it all on their iPhones. So here are some teaching evaluations examples that I received. You can read this. I'm going to, you know, leave it on the screen a little bit so you can just have a glance. Apparently, they enjoy the class. And here are some examples from this year, this summer. So it's pretty consistent that the students like the class and they are very fond of the class and enjoy immensely participating in it and making music. Of course, there are problems with these kinds of classes. First of all, responsibility. Not all students are equally responsible. So I have to constantly remind them of deadlines and push them through emails so that they don't procrastinate, they deliver things on time. Then they also get distracted by all kinds of things so they don't focus as much as you would hope to. And they have attention span problems. But in general, I was very pleased with the results and I thought that I succeeded in creating something new and something that is different than most of the regular academic face-to-face -face curriculum. So thank you for your listening. And if you have any questions, you can email those at the address provided below.